Yes, family, blessed love. Give thanks to the life giver and the keeper of life, Emperor Haile Selassie the first. Great joy, as always, welcoming you into the lair, the tiger's lair. Definitely the tiger's nest in full effect. Honorable priest Isaac here with you, spreading joy and happiness to the full community, father and mother of creation with us. We have a wonderful sit down with you this evening. We are going to be going into some African history, some Southern African history, Zimbabwe. We're going to be going to South Africa, as it's called. We're talking about KwaZulu Natal. Yeah, we're going to be going into some Zulu history and, of course, some battle history and some war history. And usually, you know, when we hear about Zulu, everyone will tell the Shaka, Shaka Zulu or Shaka, the Zulu, the king of the Zulus. But we're going to be, you know, showing you exactly how we stood up against the enemy and even surprised them several times before they eventually colonized the whole area. So just, just definitely make sure you come and sit in for a scholarly reason this evening. You know, we're not going to be debating and, and, and wondering and, and trying to, you know, figure out anything. We're just going to be putting history on the table so we can edify ourselves and strengthen ourselves as it relates to knowledge. We'll be touching upon some, some kings of the, the Zulu kingdom and empire that we may not know about some of us. For sure, I want to highlight um, Sichuayo, for sure, he will definitely have a, a, a serious position in this discussion this evening, that's Sichuayo. And of course, Mzili Kaze also will be another Zulu king. He was one that broke away from Shaka and, and is said to have been renowned even by himself. But you don't usually hear about these kings, so we will be going into them. But of course, I'm highlighting family. The Tiger's Nest, as, as, as always, every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I'm talking about Radio Anu. But this Tuesday, we're going to have a very special program. This Tuesday, which is Tuesday, the 20th day of September, in the Tiger's Nest. We're going to have with us special guests. We're talking about the Honorable Dr. Kemet Shockley. Yes, he'll be sitting in with the tiger. So make sure you put this in your in your calendar. Make sure you make a note of this so you can join us on Radio Anu. I'm talking about on the Priest Isaacs Institute of Holistic Knowledge website. Remember, all the, the links are in the description below this video. So you can just go below the video now save the link to Radio Anu. Just scroll down. You're going to see Radio Anu. Save the link. Or better yet, press it and, and let an, another tab open and, and then listen to the rest of this video. And then you go to Radio Anu. But family, I'm talking about Tuesday evening. Me and the good brother will be speaking of understanding the cultural war on Black people, Black youth specifically. And I am sure you would have seen this good brother on the... Um, on the Hidden Colors series. Hidden Colors, yes, he's on the Hidden Colors series. And of course, he definitely has a lot of, a wealth of knowledge to share with us. He has a documentary coming out. We're going to be speaking about all of that. Make sure you tune in um, on Radio Anu. That's Tuesday on Radio Anu, the Tiger's Nest radio program, 7 p.m. You're not going to be there? Well, family, that's, that's easy. You know what we do. You can be a subscriber. Once you are a subscriber to the Tiger's Nest radio program, you don't have to worry if you're going to be there, if you're going to be here, if you're going to be somewhere else. It doesn't make a difference. When you wake up in the morning, we're going to already have the program sent to you via your email. You're going to have it in your inbox and you, it will be right there for you to just press play and hear the program from the evening before because you were working late or you fell asleep or you forgot or whatever it is you go through while you don't get the nest. So the point is, Make sure you subscribe, family. Subscribe to the Tiger's Nest. And for sure, you definitely will not miss this program or none of the programs that we have for you. Every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the Tiger's Nest, 7 p.m. radio. I know for sure. And remember, as I said, all the links are in the description below this video. All right. Now, let me just go into... 
the whole meditation here. So, so of course, you know, with the the death of Queen Elizabeth II, many ones have been speaking about the whole aspect of what she represented and and she being the face of colonial colonialism and near colonialism and and even down to be in the face of slavery and oppression on black people in general now when you really observe this we speak about her becoming the queen of england even in kenya eh? and when the mau mau were battling to free up kenya remember you know she was already queen of england when a lot of the atrocities came down on the brothers and sisters in, in East Africa, she was already the queen of England. And this atrocity has continued in Kenya, in, in Tanzania, in, in Uganda, in South Africa. We don't even have to speak about that in Zimbabwe. And when even Robert Mugabe stood up and said, hey, listen, man, we need to get back some of this land that you have here for us. Eh? She didn't like that. And they, they started to chastise Robert Mugabe. Tell me I'm lying there, man. It's the truth. The same Idi Amin, the butcher of Uganda. Do you know he was once the darling of England? Idi Amin. Even Israel loved him. Idi Amin. But when he decided that, hey, listen, man, we need to hold the economic wealth of our people for ourselves. Yeah. The economic war began and he said, the Jews got to go and the Asians got to go. All of a sudden he had people's heads in his refrigerator. He never had it before, but all of a sudden he's eating the hearts of his, his ex-wives. Now imagine that. Hmm? that, that, that is what they do to you when you stand up for your right, especially if they can't assassinate you, they're gonna assassinate your character or try some way, you know, to 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 take you out so speaking of assassination really you know we we, we all know of the history of uh, shaka the king of the zulus and if we don't know at least we'd always hear about shaka zulu even if it is in a song we hear about the great king shaka of of, of southern africa and many of us may not know exactly how that great king came to his demise but he was one that was also assassinated, you know, taken out by his actual brothers, really. You know, we, we speak about Thomas Sankara, who was, who was taken out by someone who was considered to be his brother, being Blaise Compare. We speak about even Patrice Lumumba, who was taken out by one of his chief generals, someone that would also be continue, considered to be, you know, a right-hand man and a, a confidant, which is Joseph Mobutu, King Shaka, because really, you know, real academics don't like to hear him be referred to as Shaka Zulu. To, to some, it is some, it's a form of disrespect to call him in that way, but Shaka, the king of the Zulus. But whatever the case is, um, King Shaka, was actually killed and taken out by his brother who literally came to the throne after him. And he, Shaka, was assassinated in 1828. Now, really, under King Shaka, you had what is known as the N Enfakane. And the Enfakane or Enfakani really is what is known as the crushing um meaning that at that time you could consider that the zulu kingdom was much more united than it became because even during the time of shaka king shaka the king of the zulus there was there was um uh, separative move separatist pardon me movements within the kingdom taking place so earlier, I also mentioned a king by the name of M. Zilikaze. M. Zilikaze is considered to be a general of the status of Shaka. And he, the same M. Zilikaze, 
really what he did, he formed his own faction of the Zulu kingdom as well. And it said that he controlled, I think, is the whole um, um, Bolo, Boloweo region. And he is considered to be an individual that would have given the British terror as well, because he was a part of Shaka's kingdom. But for whatever reason, there was there was um, a difference of opinions, and they definitely came to their part. So, as I said, the great King Shaka, the king of the Zulus specifically, and as I said, he specifically was killed by his brother. This, this, this is his brother, but um, this is not his brother that killed him. The brother that killed him was known as um, Dingani, and this is M. Pandey. So this brother here, M. Pandey, ruled after Dingani, uh, and this M. Pandey is actually the father of uh, Sitchwayu. But before we go into all of that, I want to read some information for you here, and um, that will definitely carry us into a better understanding of exactly what we are dealing with. I will give thanks, you know, for your presence with us. Now, I'm going to read something here. This is taken from um, sahistory.org. That's obviously South African history.org, really. And it will be highlighting King Sichuayo. And it says here, and I'm not going to read everything. There's a lot of history here. I actually went through this before we came on air just to see exactly what they have in here. There are a few things I see missing that I want to put in as well. Of course, this is history that we would have definitely studied. So it says here now, King Situeo's place of birth was his father's Mpande, that's his father, um, Kral of Mlambongo Wenya. Mm -hmm. He was born in 1826, a very troubled period in the history of the Zulu kingdom. At, at, at time of his birth, that should be at the time of his birth. That's a little grammatical error there. That's not me. At the time of his birth, Shaka Zulu was wielding a very powerful command of the Zulu nation. Sichuayo's father, M. Pande was Shaka Zulu's half brother. So this is the Sichuay that we um pardon me. This is the M. Pande that we have been highlighting to you. He specifically is actually the brother of Shaka. Now, really, just to fast forward to exactly after Shaka um, was killed by his brother. His brother specifically, his rule was somewhat, this is Ding Gandhi. His rule was considered to be weak. And after he lost power, M. Pande became the king of the Zulus. But M. Pande had, uh, you could say, uh, was at loggerheads with his own son, which is the same Sichuayo. And they went back and forward to the point that the British had to intervene, not necessarily had to intervene, but I want us to comprehend this. Eh? You need to understand the, the, the nature of politics. Listen to me, family. I want you to understand the nature of the politics in the specifically the region we're dealing with now, the Zulu kingdom and the British. Very, very important. And, and I'm only dealing with it as far as history shows us. All right, so let us continue to read this and I want us to follow this um, clearly so we can understand where we're going. So I already give you an idea of where we are in history. Okay, good. Now, it is saying here, Mpande became king of the Zulus following his defeat of King Dingane's army in 1840, Mpande, 
I remember all of these uh, Shakra's brothers. And Pande had announced Sichua, Sichuayo as his heir shortly before becoming king. This was at an unusual early stage. And Pande even took the step of introducing Sichuayo to the Boer um, uh, Volksrad at the Pietre Maritzburg in 1839. The rule of succession is that the heir is born of the woman whom the king makes his chief wife. Sichuayo was declared heir because he was born of a wife given to Npande by Dingane. All right. During his reign, and this this caused some trouble in the in the um, in the times to come. It says here, during his reign, Mpande was faced with both British and Afrikaner settlers on his border. Follow this good. Eh? During his reign, Mpande was faced with both British and Afrikaner settlers. Africaners are not Africans in them. These are Europeans as well. Okay. So during his reign, Mpande were faced, was faced, pardon me, with both British and African as settlers on his borders. And he continuously tried not to alienate either party. Huh? You may say, why? Because it was all politics. Eh? The, the Zulu leaders, specifically after Shaka, began to politically befriend the enemy then. It may have been, some, some historians look at it as maybe a weak approach, and some look at it as a strategic approach. You can be the judge, but let's follow. I'll give you more information that will make you the judge. Listen good. So um, he continuously tried not to alienate either party, uh, siding some of the Zulu's kingdom land, Mpande was often viewed as a weak man in, com in comparison to his contemporaries as a result, and Chetswayo began gaining influence over the Zulu people. So, so his own son, um, Sichuayo, began gaining influence according to this because his own father was considered to be, you know, somewhat as a, a, a weak leader. You know, Mpande was considered to be somewhat of a, lead, a weak leader. He wasn't like the great King Shaka, you know, the, the great warrior king. You know, he was all right. He was definitely better than his other brother who killed Shaka, which is uh, uh, Dingane. You understand? But he, Mpande, I hope you're taking all the names and taking notes, Mpande himself, though, he, he was still seen somewhat weak. He was making proposals with the British and the Africaners and, and giving them strips of land for, for, for safeguarding his borders and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, wow, where is he going with this? So his own son, uh, Sichuayo, was seen as a more a more upright man. He, in fact, his physical, his physical presence. He was like um, that. That man there, I think, is Jack Dempsey, that that famous black boxer, the big one there. Um, uh, I think that's him, eh? Yeah. And and he was big and he was strong. He was hefty, like an idiomin sort of thing. So the people just naturally looked up to him. But if you judge history pr properly, you know, you may even see that he himself at one time um, basically had to play that same political um, diplomacy, diplomatic role. And we're getting into all of that right now. This is what I'm highlighting to you. Okay, so you, I just saying this so you could understand where we are. Good. So he says now, uh, um, uh, after I said Sichuayo began gaining influence over the Zulu people, Mpande became worried. Listen to this family. Mpande became worried that Sichuayo was gaining too much influence and began to favor Mbayazi, a son of his most beloved wife. Sichuayo and Mbayazi uh, became rivals. 
You understand? So he definitely, this is M. Pande now, became fearful because the people seem to be favoring his son, Situa, um, um, Situa over him. So he bring his other son into the picture so that, you know, something could, we could make some sort of amends. All right. Anyway, we can go, you know, fast forward as such, you know, because Situayo became king in 1840. When Mpande died, his son, yes, tried to take the throne, but yet still he was defeated by Situayo. And in fact, let me just read something here, even before Mpande died. It says here, Mpande tried to prevent Situayo from threatening his power. I want you to listen to this, um, students. Situayo, uh, uh, Mpande, pardon me, tried to prevent Situayo from threatening his power. And he again appealed to both the British and the Africaners for support. The British Secretary for Native Affairs in Natal, which is one Theophilus Shepstone, remember this demon's name, Theophilus Shepstone encouraged Situayo to proclaim his loyalty to his father. And in, 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 uh, in 1865, Mpande and Situayo um, were reconciled. And in 1857, Situayo and Mpande came to terms. And Situayo would have effective control of the nation whereas Mpande would retain ultimate authority and the title of king. So, so really, you know, as this would show you, even before he died, you know, it was obviously seen that Situayo had a, a, a certain level of, of power that he already held on to, that, you know, that the people already was proclaiming him to be the ruler of them all. But anyway, the same... Uh, what's his name? The same Shepstone was invited by Situayo to his coronation because, you know, trying to make some sort of diplomatic connection with the British people. But then the same Shepstone turned his back on Situayo. Well, not turned his back. His back was always turned. He was just faking the funk you know how it is, and began to rob land away from them. Now, this is what, this is what, um, this is what Theophilus Shepst Shepstone says, and I will read this as it relates to the king, King um, Situayo, and this is his words. Speaking of the king, eh? A man of considerable ability, much force of character, and has a dignified manner. In all conversation with him, he was remarkably frank and straightforward. He is naturally proud and of the military, military traditions of his family especially the policy and deeds of his uncle and predecessor, Shaka. So you see clearly now the difference here, even between him and his uncles before him. Because remember, you know, it wasn't just in, in Ghana that assassinated Shaka, the king of the Zulu. You know. He had another brother with him. Plus then you got this other brother here, that is um, impending, and they all going against the true standard of Shaka. And this is why now you have one like Situayo who came into the picture, maybe a little more diplomatic than Shaka. Yes, but for sure, he came into the picture with the kind of mentality that Shaka, the king of the Zulu, would have. Hmm. But as I said, with all of that nice words, Within no time, he turned his back on him because he spoke these words in 1973. 
This was about the time of his coronation. Um, sorry, 1873. 1873. This is the time of his coronation. I think I said 1840 earlier too. Pardon me. If I did, forgive me. As I said, 1873, he was 40 years of age when he became king. That is um, Sichuayo. He was 40 years of age. This is a picture of him and the same Shepstone. <laughs> See how bigger he is, like a, a real idiomin kind of thing. He was 40 years of age when he became king. But this is about in 18, not 19, 18, um, 73. So this same British official was the one that asked him to dismantle his army. In fact, they required of him that he dismantled his army. And because he refused to dismantle um, his army, they threatened to attack him, which they did. Listen to this. They threatened to attack him, which they did. They attacked at what is known as, well, they came to attack at what is known as the Battle of Isanwana or Isanwana. Now, Isanwana, I-S-A-N-D-L, but the L is silent. W-A-N-A. -A. But listen to this. Before the attack, this is what the king said. King um, Sichuana. Uh, Sichuayo. He said, the man, listen to this. I heard of troops arriving in Natal. That they are coming to attack the Zulus, and to seize me, the king. This is King Sichuayo speaking. What have I done wrong that I should be seized like an umtakata, which is said to be a wrongdoer in the language? All right. Now listen to this. He goes on to say, and this is what they say his words were. The English are my fathers. This is what they say, he said. I do not wish to quarrel with them, but to live as I have always lived at peace with the British. But the British did not listen to um, Situayo. And according to the history, it was in January 19, I keep saying 19, 1879, in January 1879, the British specifically came into Zululand. They crossed into Zululand with soldiers and they were attacked by 20,000 Zulus, they were ambushed by 20,000 Zulus at Isandwana. It is the slaughter of Isandwana or Isandwana. The British lost 870 soldiers that day at the hands of the Zulus. Tell them to teach this in the schools, 55 British soldiers were left alive. 55 British soldiers were left alive. They were surrounded by the Zulus. A few, one, two Zulus, you know, went down as martyrs. 870 British soldiers bit the dust. 55 left alive. That was a resounding defeat for the colonializers in the scramble for Africa. Tell them to teach that in school. Why don't they tell us about the Battle of Dogali? 
five minutes it took and we took out hundreds of the Italians in Ethiopia. Teach that in school. What about the Battle of Adawa? Teach that in school, Rasta. Make our children proud of ourselves. As I was telling my son just the other day, yo, it's about 10 or 12 times the Ashanti people defeat the British. It's one time, one time, one time the British win a battle and it was the last battle. These people should be ashamed. They're on the sea with ships firing cannonballs at people with spears. Look on them pictures. Who have gun and who have spears, eh? They're firing cannonball at people with spears and it, it takes them 12 battles to win one. So when you light your chalice, give thanks for this battle. Give thanks for the victory here. Um, um, Isanwana. Some say Isanwana. When we defeated the British. King Sichwayo. His command. The king of the Zulus. Nephew of the great Shaka. The king of the Zulus. And he kept the Shaka spirit. But a couple months after this, because you know how the story ended. There ain't no Zulu Empire now. I mean, the Zulu's keeping up an energy, but we know how the story ended. So this obviously wasn't the last battle. There was more that followed. And it didn't take too long. This defeat was so horrible that they came back in three or so months. and did a number on the Zulu people with more artillery. Look at spears we have, you know, spears made out of animal hide and skin, and, uh, and not spears, um, shields made out of animal hide and skin and spears. Look, they man have guns uh, with, with rifles, with sword on them, and they're still lying dead on the ground. They have to go home and get Bigger artillery and cannonball and all sorts of things. And that is how the whole Zulu versus the British thing eventually came to an end. So yeah, man, family, let's remember these wars here of Isanwana. Let's remember, you know, not this demon dog here, but remember, you know, mighty, mighty you know, King Sichwayo. You know, I mean, even though he said the British is his father, and the thing is, eh, when they eventually arrested him now, after they defeated him, he he pleaded to, because they, you know, arrested him and his family, he pleaded to Queen Victoria. He, queen, he pleaded to the Elizabeth II of the day, and she did not answer his plea. Because they took away all the land and she did not answer his plea. You understand? None of them people in the royal house in, 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 in London condemn Victoria. All they say is that slavery was a stain and this and that. It. Nobody said Victoria was wrong and Victoria was wicked and what the evil thing she did. What do you think Charles have to say? A lot of evil and wicked things are still being kept up. Don't look at it as if it's something that done gone already. We need an ex in for Kani, a united crushing of the wicked. So give thanks, you know, King Sichwayo and, and, and all the, the kings that lived up and did what was right. And as I said, family, Make sure you join us Tuesday evening on Radio Anu talking about the international flavor, the universal spice. What time? 7 p.m. sharp Tuesday. Well, join us Monday too, eh? 
Join us Monday the 19th because we're going to be live 7 p.m. sharp. We're going to have a wonderful, wonderful Tiger's Nest radio program as we always do. But on Tuesday, we're going to have a very special program. We're going to have the good brother with us. We're talking about Dr. Kemet Shockley. That's the Honorable Dr. Kemet Shockley. Definitely, of course, you will know him from the Hidden Colors uh, uh, documentary series. And we will be speaking about understanding the cultural war on black people, specifically highlighting the cultural war on black children, on the black youth. And as I said, this will be on Radio Anu. You don't know how to get to Radio Anu. The link is in the description below of this video. Just scroll down and you press it. They go straight to Prince Isaac's Institute of Holistic Knowledge. You can go straight to Radio Anu itself. And of course, remember, if you if you are not a subscriber, this is the time to subscribe. I don't think you want to miss this program here Tuesday night. Nah, man, this is going to be a wonderful program. So make sure you subscribe to subscribe to Radio Anu. Well, not Radio Anu, really, but to subscribe to The Tiger's Nest. It's a very easy thing to do. Just contact me, you know, email me. Definitely WhatsApp, whatever the case is. And let us know you'd like to be a part of the subscription team so you can get the program every evening after the program is done, you get it. So let's just suppose you want to hear this reasoning. This is, I mean, wow, what a wonderful vibe this is going to be Tuesday night. Let's just say you want to hear this reasoning. And you just ain't going to be able to listen to it. Just subscribe. It's just pennies, you know, to subscribe. And you will get the program every day. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to call and say, hey, um, um, what time? It's going to be there. It's going to be there in your inbox via the email. You get the, the tiger's nest from the night before. So just subscribe and cool out. You don't even have to worry again. And you get every episode of the tiger's nest radio program. Definitely. And this is one you do not want to miss. So you don't know what to do. All the link is in the description below. Even the means and ways for you to make your payment, Cash App and PayPal also, you could definitely, um, you know, um, scroll down below the video and all of that, those links are there. Wonderful. So looking forward to you Tuesday night. In fact, looking forward to you Monday evening too, 7 p.m. sharp. I'm talking about the, the Precise Institute of Holistic Knowledge, Radio Anu, the Tiger's Nest. Yes, family, love and majesty. Enough things going on, you know, but when we come again, I'll tell you more. Holy Emmanuel, I, Selassie, I, Ja Rastafari, blessed Lord, give thanks.